Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. This is Toyin Yumesiri, and today I have a great guest with you. Yes, are you back on? Uh, I can see myself, but I no longer see you. Okay, let's let me play this out. Now I see you, but not me. <laughs> okay, now this is. I hope you're not having the system stuff. We're we're live, and I have um. Yes. Okay. Yeah, hey, finally. <laughs> Opa. <laughs> At last. This, yeah. Today is going to be fun. I told people it's going to be on fire. Like you're the right person to to bring on. So, <laughs> without much ado, let me officially introduce you because we were talking and we're already excited. Okay. Colonel Chris White is is retired now, but <laughs> how do you like people to call you now that you're? Uh, they can just call me Chris or you can call me King of Haotang. Take your choice. No. <laughs> Ooh, you see? Okay. I've, I've decided to become royalty. Apparently, it has perks like interviews on Oprah. <laughs> I'm the Oprah of Africa. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. Let me go straight on. Sure. Um, you served in the, the U.S. military as an intelligence officer and foreign area officer for Sub-Saharan Africa and as the director of African studies at the U.S. Army War College in Pennsylvania. I don't know how to say the, the state name. How do you say that? Caliste? Oh, Carlisle. Just Carlisle. Carlisle. Okay. The name, the spelling is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, you were previously the senior military advisor to the U.S. mission to the African Union, USAU. Mm -hmm. And um, you have experience, um, extensive experience across Europe with three tours in Germany, tour in Italy, um south asia southwest asia in africa tunisia liberia botswana malawi niger <laughs> on and on you uganda ethiopia wow 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 your tour in africa includes duty as the senior defense representative and security assistant to officers and attache, attache um, assignments you're a published author and you have like I said, extensive experience in defense, security, strat strategic, tactical, and operations intelligence, and on and on. You remind me of John, and I, it's likely that John is actually watching this as well, wherever he's, he, he is in the world. And you're, you're, you're one of those people that I have to be careful what question I ask you because you've seen it all, right? <laughs> you've been around the world, you've seen it all, you're having a blast. So how are you? How is retirement? I'm treating you. <laughs> it's killing me, Toyin. What's retirement? I work 16 hours a day, seven days a week. There's no retirement. I'm, I retire from active duty in the military, and not by choice, but by law. You can only serve a certain period of time. And after 36 and a half years, uh, the law told me to hit the road, and it was time to go. So I wasn't ready. I would still be on active duty, although um, all the COVID restrictions would probably make me go crazy every day at work. But but I would still be on active duty if I were allowed to be. I, I made that choice to support and defend the Constitution and help people in this country around the world. And, and I kind of miss it. People ask me, do you miss being in the Army? Not really. It's a bureaucracy. <laughs> I don't miss that at all. But I do miss, um, and, and, and they're probably like, well, yeah, it's probably because you want to grow that beard. No, this is a lockdown beard. This is a civil protest. When the lockdown, dis <laughs> when the lockdown disappears, the beard comes off. But not until after I make one trip to Europe and one trip to Africa, just so I can get the look on the face of the immigration officials as I walk through looking like something from... <laughs> He they'll looks, be like, he, he looks looking dangerous. at your passport. They'll look at your passport and say, are you the same person? Nope. Well, well I know my, my new phone doesn't recognize me sometimes, depending <laughs> on my hair's brush, that face recognition. So, yeah, no. No, uh, you're right. I've, uh, it's, you know, it's kind of embarrassing, Toy, not, not to boast. I mean, you just, it's, it's, my CV is pretty full. I've done a lot. Oh, yeah. and we, we haven't even touched on it. HIV programs, tuberculosis, malaria, development, schools, roads, highways, uh, peacekeeping, counterterrorism, development, take your pick. Uh, undergraduate educator at university, postgraduate educator at university. Uh, yeah, I've done all this stuff, and uh, it's it's been pretty cool. I've enjoyed the ride so far. The only regret I have is that, and I knew this as a young man, it goes <laughs> it goes far too fast. So enjoy it while you can, mm. because next thing you know, you're nine thousand years old, and you know you're sitting in a retirement home somewhere. <laughs> yeah, but I I see you're enjoying you're enjoying this moment this moment right now. I can see you, um, and I have to congratulate you on all your you know, achievements, it's it's beyond, I, I, I can't even, wow, incredible, right? And it's such an honor to be engaging with you. And I also want to also thank you for visiting back in, the last time we saw in person was yeah. 2019, where you were one of our keynote speakers at the Trade with Africa Summit, 
here in Chicago. So thank you. At that time, you were active. You were still active. Yep. Yep. So you 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 were. I mean, thank you so much. Your presentation. I remember. People still watch it now. It's really well watched, and it was you know very alive, very um, energetic, very educative, and you know it, it's people really enjoyed um, your presentation, and I'm sure they're absolutely going to enjoy this one as well. So thank you for being here. No, it's my pleasure. Listen, uh, actually, I, I just enjoyed chat with you. You've been a guest on my program on YouTube, yes. and that was it was fantastic. Really enjoyed that, and and you didn't hesitate to accept my offer. I was grateful for that. I oh, did come on! No, no, no. I was really grateful for it. You, you were, you know, you, right away. You know, listen, booking guests. You know this because you do this can be a rewarding but an incredibly frustrating experience. <laughs> um, I had a guest that took me four months to get on the program, not because wow. he didn't want to come on, but just scheduling conflicts. And I had another guest that took six months to get on the program. I finally got both of those guests on. Uh, so, I can, And then I've had other people like, yeah, um, uh, can I, uh, okay, I'm the agent for this person. Yeah, let me get with them. And like 12 hours later, okay, yes, we're going to do it Thursday. Whoa, quick, let me scramble really quickly. Yeah, no, so it's, uh, I enjoyed you on the program. I really enjoyed the Trade with Africa Summit there in Chicago. And and oh. for now, I always get to say I was at the McDonald's University campus. Yes. I was at. Otherwise, I would never have been there because I never worked at McDonald's. But uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a great event with a lot of good speakers. And uh, the gentleman who was uh, wrote the book on the car industry in South Africa I found especially interesting. Um, it was really a uh, really good experience. Um, yeah. So uh, thanks a lot for inviting me on. And let's, let's yes. get to it. What do you want yes. to talk about today? Yes. Oh, so be before that, you talked about the McDonald's. Um, they actually sold it to the a billionaire so after, right after we finished our event it's now sold they sold that facility and they moved i believe they are now downtown chicago oh wow okay okay cool yes yeah. yeah so i want to talk about u.s expansion to africa current states mm -hmm. this is not this is your area right mm -hmm. um i want to talk about through the lens of diplomacy security and also we'll, we'll venture into trade and investment because i also want to see um, if you're experiencing the same thing, if you're seeing the same thing I'm seeing, and now that you're technically a civilian now, what mm -hmm. has changed in your world? Maybe we should start with that. Like okay, now sure. that you're now that you're a civilian, um, your engagement with Africans and your engagement within the um, within the space, African affairs space, mm -hmm. what has changed for you? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I just no, want no, to no. really see what has changed. I think that's a really good question, a great interview question, and one that people haven't asked me, um, so I'm glad you asked it. Well, <laughs> I, I would say that, um, of course, it depends on one's personality, but with my personality, you knowing that I'm such a shy, shrinking violet and unwilling to, no, <laughs> no. no but uh, no, the, the key difference for me is that um, I am no longer constrained by my role as a commissioned officer and my subordination in a hierarchical system in which I must you know, follow, the, I mean, as long as it's lawful and moral, I must follow it. And I'm no longer constrained by the fact that I'm a diplomat. So, I mean, I can say whatever I want, which has has, has its, its dangers, but it also is liberating in many ways. I mean, if I want to say that Donald Trump's an idiot and Joe Biden's an idiot, I can. In fact, they are both idiots. No, no, so, oh, but, uh, <laughs> no just kidding. But, okay. uh, but, uh, but no, not kidding. Seriously. No, but uh, I, I, I couldn't say that before because either I was in a diplomatic role or I was um, – or I was in in, in in a uniform role and it was inappropriate. So that, that so people don't understand that when you serve in uniform, particularly as a commission officer, you surrender mm. willingly a lot of your guaranteed rights under our constitution. So wow. your, your freedom of speech is greatly constrained. Now I can be a member of a political party if I want, which I refused to do as a commission officer because I thought it was inappropriate. Not that it was morally wrong, but just officers have far greater influence than they realize. And wow. I didn't I didn't want to be in a position where people would overhear me say something and think, oh, well, there's the boss. He's going to do this. So we should do that too when it came to politics. So I was an independent the entire time I was in uniform. So that's one mm -hmm. thing. I joined a political party grudgingly just so I could vote in a primary because you can't vote in a primary unless you're a political party. Uh, and I get to say what I want um, yeah. and within reason. So as long as I'm not abusive to people. Uh, well, public figures are a different story. You can be abusive to them because they're a public figure. But <laughs> and I'm talking about individuals. But uh, no, it's uh, honestly, I wow. mean, when, when, when I hear people come up with the usual tired excuses for why things are the way they are, um, I refute them with facts and logic. And uh, before I had to dance around the facts and logic sometimes because they were politically um, damaging mm. to the United States and its foreign policy or its national security. Uh, and that's just the reality of things. So anyway, so wow. it's, been, it's been liberating in that respect. So yeah, anyway, I've enjoyed that. Have you gotten into any troubles lately? <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, I've, I I don't usually get in trouble. I've got into fake trouble. I got into okay. fake trouble. I mean, look, if, if you get into trouble for actions you take, okay, that's mm. one thing. 
but I got in trouble on YouTube. Um, my videos were 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 pulled down and they claim violations of policies, which I never violated. I appealed it within 30 minutes, the video was reinstated. 90 minutes later, the video was removed for the same reason. Appealed it. This happened four videos uh, and it had damaging effect on my on my broadcast channel. Uh, but I didn't do anything. I didn't violate their standards. Um, listen, uh, Toyan, I don't I may not like certain rules, but I follow them. I, you know, like the mask mandate, I, I'm not a fan, but I wear it. If I'm required to wear it, I wear the mask. I comply. Um, you know, I do that. I, I'm not a rule breaker. I believe in the rule of law, whether I like the law or not. If I don't like the law, I'll seek to change it. Uh, but um, yeah, no, I don't break rules. And no, so I've not gotten in any trouble for anything I've done legitimately. No. <laughs> good, good. So question, you talked yeah. about Donald Trump and Biden. Okay. Have you seen any change when it comes to US Africa engagement? you know, going from um, Trump's presidency mm -hmm. to now uh, Biden's presidency, have you seen any shifts or the same old, same old? I think it's too soon to make that claim. Um, look, when, when Jen Psaki gets up on, at the lectern and tells us stories about what the president's saying or not saying, um, you got to take that for, you know, what it is. It's a press spokesperson. And very little has been said about Africa so far. Um, the president has committed to spending $4 billion for the COVAX uh, facility to get develop vaccine to developing countries. Ironically, as a veteran, I can't get the vaccination. So I'm at the bottom of the list. So <laughs> wow. but, we're, but, we're, but we're buying it for the rest of the world. I, look, I have no objections to that. And also, I'm not in a hurry to get the vaccine. So I'm just, I'm, I'm making a, a facetious point, but it's a legitimate one. Uh, so, so I, it's too soon to say, and honestly, this is the same foreign policy that George Bush gave us, that Barack Obama inherited, that he tweaked modestly, that went to Donald Trump, which didn't change despite all this story. Oh, my God, he hates Africa. He says, asshole countries. Virtually nothing changed. The only change mm. was that uh, John Bolton announced uh, two years into the administration, less than two years, that they had an African policy, one focused on trade and investment. That's a lovely sentiment. And they made a nice web page and they talk about this, they talk about that. But as I pointed out, um, hold your breath, let's wait and see what happens. And not much has happened. So this is pretty much, in my view, in the aggregate, the same form. I mean, what people don't understand is that the U.S. government is nearly a, well, now it's more with all these stimulus packages, but a $5 trillion a year operation. $5 trillion a year. You don't stop programs like that. Mm. So for instance, the president's emergency program for AIDS relief, emergency, which was created in 2003, 18 years ago, is wow. still the president's emergency program for AIDS relief. We're still spending 30, $40 billion. You know, it's, 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 it's a lot of money. Um, and uh, I'm not objecting to it because PEPFAR has been a brilliant program. It's had a massive and wonderful effect on Africa, particularly Southern Africa. It's made a huge impact. It's saved lives. It's helped alter behavior. It's changed culture and it's been for the benefit by and large. But, um, you really can't call it the president's emergency program. An emergency doesn't <laughs> last 18 years. I mean, mm. Mount Vesuvius doesn't explode for 18 years outside of Pompeii or Naples. It only does it for a few days or weeks, and then it's all over, and you move on. So my point is that that's still around uh, by or not by uh, Obama's uh, Power Africa. Still around. These things, some come and go. They usually get renamed. And mm. like, for instance, a lot of the money we were spending on on security assistance and peace negotiation, things like that, got rebranded in part of the Security Governance Initiative, which was an okay. Obama era thing, which came with no funding. So they just took it from other places. And by the way, to be fair, PEPFAR, when it was created, took basically all the HIV spending in all the federal agencies and put it under PEPFAR. Now, they added a lot of funding later on, uh, wow. almost immediately. But initially, just all the programs that existed, including the Department of Defense programs, were lumped under PEPFAR. That's not a good or bad thing. But, wow. but when you say you create a new program, if you don't bring funding, then it's not a new mm. program. It's just a new label. Oh, why new bottles? <laughs> okay, good. I'm sure you're educating us. I see uh, Mr. Joseph joining. Thank you for joining. Um, thank you so much. So anyone joining, please just drop your names, drop your questions. This is this is the you know very very going to it's going to be a very engaging and um, conversation. I'm already like on my on the edge of my seat right now. I'm super excited. <laughs> so okay. Now, on the side of the Africans with the AFCFTA, what yep. shifts have you observed, if any? Because you've been within the Africa, you know, conversation for years, mm -hmm. right? So what has changed and what are you seeing, if any? Okay, so first off, uh, up front, caveat, disclaimer, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which we're going to talk about now, is something that I think is a great idea. It's a mm. wonderful idea. However, like everything else, um, if you have no enforcement, if you have no remedy mechanisms, if you don't protect people, 
then you have a problem. So the problem I have with African elites, and not all, obviously, there's a lot of great African elites out there, but generally speaking, those who come out and promote this. First off, think about this agreement. In mm -hmm. order for it to go into effect, of the 48 countries that signed up to do it and agreed to do it in Africa, out of 54 or 57, depending where they count, Puntland, Somaliland, and Western Sahara. But anyway, uh, so of, the, of those countries, 48 countries, only 22 had to deliver their ratification um, notice to the African Union. 22. That's less than 50% in order for it to take effect in all countries. Now, it came in effect in stages, uh, but here's some of the shortcomings with it from my perspective. Number one, uh, there is no intellectual property, copyright, and trademark provisions clearly spelled out in the agreement. They said that this would be something that would be discussed and proposed to vote on in January of 2021. But of course, with COVID coming along, that didn't happen. So if you are a Senegalese and you develop an awesome new way to make a bottle opener, that no one else has come up with, and you try to trademark that, mm. you can trademark it maybe in Senegal, but what's to stop the guy in Sierra Leone or in Nigeria from duplicating it and selling it, not paying your royalties? Very mm. little. Mm. And more, more to the point, even if there is a rule in place, because there's rules in place, they'll eventually they'll have these for the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. They'll put in this copyright and trademark uh, protections. But what happens is that um, when that guy in Nigeria does steal your idea, what do you do? Which court do you go to? Is there a mm -hmm. court you can have in a Will a court protect you? And when Kenya uses an excuse of contaminated maize to prevent maize imports coming in from Uganda, which are flooding the market because they're more productive in Uganda and they're flooding the Kenya market, depressing Kenya farmers, if they do that to protect their economy, what is the recourse for Ugandan farmers? Do mm -hmm. they have a court they can go to to seek redress? These are some of the shortcomings of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. There's mm. too many people going, oh, look at this, Africa, it's the biggest trading block in the world. No, it's not. I mean, uh, me and Walmart are almost a bigger trading block than Africa. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm being a little facetious there, but my point is that inter-African trade is almost non-existent. It's very little mm. taking place. It has tremendous potential, and that's mm. the good news about it. But I would wish that these African elites would stop selling this for what it's not a panacea for Africa's development woes. It can be. But if you mm. don't put in right of redress, functioning courts and legal mechanisms where you can actually punish someone for being a transgressor, then people will transgress. They will mm. put informal and formal tariffs and barriers in place to protect their marketplace. South Africa will do it. Kenya will do it. Uganda will do it. And it'll devolve into that. And then mm. the agreement is just a piece of paper. It's like the Paris Climate Accord. There are no penalties mm. for violating Paris Climate Accord. None. Oh, we all mm. agree we're going to reduce our emissions. Guess what? The United States has actually reduced its emissions. We're the only industrialized country that continually has reduced its emissions almost with, with a slight blip from 2011 uh, until 2014. Every year for the past 20 years, we have reduced our emissions except for that brief period uh, because new technologies, updated cars, updated factories, new things built, better homes, better insulation. We always are improving and we've reduced our carbon output per capita and in actual terms. The rest of the world hasn't. But for the transgressors on the Paris Climate Accord, there's no there's no penalty. And the same for mm. the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. So that's a couple of the shortcomings. There are others, but but all in all, I think it's a great idea. And I'd love to see it take root and actually produce something. But people right around going, ooh, look, Africans are going to be so much better off. Not, <laughs> not in 2021, not in 2022, <laughs> maybe in 2023. Okay, I happen to be one of those people, okay? And I'll give you my own perspective more from a private okay. sector. So it's Okay, it's wait, not wait. I don't I don't I don't want to hear really hear this. So I'm just going to read I'm going to read my latest book <laughs> while you do that, okay? Yeah, I'm just I'm just I'm just going to read my book. So Come on. so so much like DJ Khalid, Khalid, I've mastered the art of uh product placement. So there you go. What's Oh, let's see. You should have sent this to me. I no, can't. It's, it's $160. I'm frugal. <laughs> that's not you, though. Did you write? I thought it's your book. It's not your book. No, I'm a chapter author in here. I wrote the chapter on the genesis and origins of the U.S. Africa Command. It's, okay, a so, it's, it's an academic it, book. Okay, read it out. Let's 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 put it out there. I usually oh. do that for our guests oh, okay, as well. There you go. well okay, let the, me read it out. So, Expanding U.S. Military Command in Africa. Yep. Wow. Elites, networks, and grand strategy. That's fantastic. I've not seen this book. Of well, all it's, the books because, out there. It's, it's because it's an academic book that costs $160 a copy, 48 for the Kindle edition on Amazon. Uh, I get nothing from it, which is fine. I contribute as an academian and as a practitioner. So um, I got my courtesy copy, which finally came this one here. Yeah. Um, yeah 160 I'm writing bucks. one. I'm walking on one right now. <laughs> okay. No, you but- this this book was a long project. I started this in 20, 
2018, wow. I think it was 2018. And because of COVID, it was supposed to come out in 20, um, in 2020, but because of COVID, it, it got delayed. So it just came out in uh, February. So wow, it just congratulations. Out, yeah. That's well, a big thanks. deal. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's, um, it, uh, it, it was an interesting experience. This is from Stellenbosch University in South Africa, and Rutledge is the one that published it. So you'll find it in universities and libraries and things like that. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Fantastic. I know a few people on here that follow us that are in the academia as well. My mm -hmm. husband is also in the academia, so I do have great respect for those people. They don't pay you enough. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm kind of weird because I'm, I, I, I am or have been an academic, taught undergraduate and postgraduate, and I'm a practitioner with, you know, actual field experience doing all this stuff. So it's, it's kind of strange. Um, depending on the audience I'm with, a lot of times they'll view me as a practitioner, and other times they'll view me as an academic. So whatever, just um, make sure you pay for my per diem so I can get there. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still going to go back to my answer, though, the one okay, you didn't want ahead, to hear. Ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So yes. So here's the thing with the AFCFT from a private yeah. sector standpoint. Yes. A lot of times when private sector wants to invest in the region, they are always asking this investor my investor mm -hmm. question is the market big enough is the market mm. big enough sure. right that's one of the things afcfta has really answered is to say the market is big enough and it's like an artificial way of creating demand mm. where investors can now rest and say okay it's what you know investing in that's the biggest reason why i say it's a game changer because what then happens is Africa can then move in the direction of Africa rising because on, until you have this kind of bold move that kind of artificially creates a, a financial incentive mm -hmm. for investors to go into a new market, um, people just stay on the sidelines. Like they're watching who is going to make the take the risk first. Like you know how this is, right? Yeah. Where it's like, oh, Africa, we know, we know, but who's going to who's going to bite it first, right? Mm -hmm. So. The AFCFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, from my standpoint, from where I sit mm -hmm. as a private sector player, mm -hmm. messages out the potential, which you also agree on. It's like if it is implemented properly, the potential is incredible. Yeah. And that's where all of the work I do now lies is the actualization and the implementation and the day-to-day -day execution of the private sector lifting this thing up. Because I agree with you in the sense of you can have things on paper, but if you do not back it with investment or resources or training and all of that, it's just on paper. We see it with Af Agua, right? African Growth Opportunity Act, the one U.S. signed 20 years ago, has been on the books for 20 years. And even today, when I educate people and we teach people about implementing and leveraging AGOA, many more people haven't heard about it in, after 20 years. Yeah. So, and, and last week I was on a platform and I shared a panel um, with His Excellency Ambassador Alba Muchanga of the African the Commissioner for Economics, Trade and Ind Industry and Mines at the mm -hmm. African, you know, AFCFTA sits at his, on his desk, right? So I had the opportunity to also engage from a private sector standpoint. And also, I believe the Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization was also on my panel. So for me, lending my voice within the private sector, the private sector has to actualize and execute on and take advantage of the AFCFTA before it can actually bring the value that it has the potential to bear. So that's my own perspective. Now, everything you said, I, I agree. Um, it's not, I think that's why they're doing it in phases. So phase one looks good, phase two, phase three, but absolutely you're right. I have um, two trademarks, so I know what it means to have, you know, to, to be worried about intellectual property and all of those things. So it's a big, big, big issue. No, absolutely. And listen, I, I've been saying this for well over two decades now, into three decades specifically when it comes, you know, you get these people like, well, corporations shouldn't be allowed to copyright things or trademark things. I mean, listen, it, it's ludicrous for somebody to copyright smile. I mean, that's a word in the English language. But I mean, we've seen people try to do things like that or get a trademark for something like that. Um but um, it is perfectly legitimate for an artist to have copyrights to their music. And uh, when I first started going to Ghana, I, the music was amazing, absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. And like, why can't I buy this anywhere? I couldn't buy it anywhere because people go listen to the artist perform live or they get a copy of a recording they've made. They pirate it. They, all, all of the streets of Accra, I could buy every musician I wanted for almost nothing. The artist mm. got no money from it. The mm. entire market was undermined. People wouldn't buy the stuff that costs full money because the full amount of money, because it takes packaging, it takes distribution, it takes promotion, it takes paying off the artist. It pay, all of that comes into play. 
But when mm. some dude is sitting in a little shack there and burning MP3s onto a DVD and selling it for, you know, two bucks on the street, this is disastrous. And so mm. that, that artist should be allowed to profit from I've never pro, I've never pirated music. I've never pirated software. Even when I was dirt poor and didn't have any money, I mm. waited and saved until I can afford the software. It really irritates me when people don't protect the intellectual property and trademarks of people come up with it. That's that's. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the right people, they're listening to this and they're going to see this. So it's going to go up on their list of to-do, I'm sure. So here's the interesting thing, talking about the creative industry, because within the context of trade and investment, the creative space is big. I know the African Exports Import Bank, Afri Exim Bank, they've actually created what they call the creative exchange. <clears throat> but what I see today is that the creatives they're having to break into the international market to mm. actually get the full value of their, you know, investment and the, the value of what they are creating. In fact, case in point, um, just this new release of the um, Coming to America too. <laughs> I, you know, I told you earlier before we joined, like I'm all all over pop culture as well. I, I see you rolling your eyes. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, listen, I, I watched <laughs> Coming to America when I was a young man and I laughed at it, but I cringe, I cringe watching it now. I'm like, oh my gosh. Imagine if some white dude had done this and played this role, oh, what they would on. say. Oh, it's called oh, my goodness. culture, Wakanda, come on. <laughs> oh, no. okay, Listen, anyway. Eddie, Eddie Murphy's hilarious, but I'm, I'm almost afraid to watch the new one. Okay, don't watch it. But here's what I, I was going to point out yeah. is the fact that one of the mainstream African musicians was actually featured yeah. towards the end of the movie. And that's that's one I'm, what I'm saying is that there are breakout stars coming out of Africa and, and trying to expand internationally because that's really where they get that's where they get the money they're looking for, right? That's where they get the value. So one of the things I try to educate my community on is to consider three markets. And those who attend my training, they would have heard me say the local market, the regional market, the international market, yep. meaning we are in the US. This is how we, what we do within the US market is our local market. For those in Nigeria, that's their local market. For those in Ghana, for those in Uganda, their country is their local market. Now, under the FCFTA, they need to start thinking about their regional market. For us here in the US, Canada, Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. That's our regional market. For those in Africa, now the continental agreement. Now, what I'm seeing is that people may be winning in their local market, meaning, oh, I'm the best thing since sliced bread in Uganda. Mm -hmm. But they don't have the skill sets to actually break into the regional market or the international market, which is beyond their region, right? right. So that's one of the areas. And I think I'm shifting the conversation now to what are you seeing now within the trade investment community? I see a lot of... Um, a lot of talk, but um, but not enough skill set to actually be able to execute on opportunities. Th that's why a lot of the things I'm doing now in our private community has to do with and holding people and shifting people because those opportunities that is being unlocked on the continent can only be leveraged or captured if you have the right skill set and the right network to go after those. So I know I just said a lot, but I want to hear no, your no, perspective on that. No, no, I agree with you. Um, I hear a lot of talk as well, and I've heard a lot of talk for three decades. Uh, that's the frustrating. That's the frustrating. No, I mean, I'm honestly, come on, it's true. It's it's frustrating. Um, it, it seems even to this day that the things that get attention are big ticket infrastructure projects in which someone mm. can loan billions of dollars to build it, whether it's a parliamentary building or the the new um, uh, dam that's just been built in uh, in in Namibia or the um, the big uh, project in um, in Ethiopia. That's where that gets the attention. Road project, things like that, port facilities, airfields. That gets attention. The other thing to this day, it's always um, you know extraction based stuff, whether it's timber mm. or it's hydrocarbons or mm. even these days the Chinese in Tanzania with agriculture. That's extraction too. There are projects that get attention that 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 really get traction, but Africa is a big continent. So I mean, for instance, you've got the Volkswagen plant in Rwanda. That's a yep. good development. Ghana's getting a mo an automobile uh, factory there. Uh, Morocco's had an expansion of their automobile capacity. That sort of manufacturing is great. But and, and this this is where I differ with a lot of people when it comes to Africa. I appreciate a lot of Africans saying we need to move into, but but you don't need to move into the industrial age. You can do partially. You should have a diverse economy that includes industrialization, mm. but you need to move into the digital age and beyond that. I mean, I, I, I look at this and I look at one of the things that held Africa back for so long was that there were no telephones. 
I mean, mm. honestly, I mean, there were no telephones. You couldn't communicate. You know, it was ridiculously expensive, and the phone lines were only good from the capital in the capital. Maybe they might reach a regional, you know, place, but that's it. And so many Africans had no way to communicate with the outside world until GSM mm. came along. When GSM came along, mobile two telecommunications took off in Africa like this, all over the continent. Suddenly, it's all over. It's ubiquitous. You can use it, and Africans as a continent made a leap beyond the plain old telephone system of mm. copper to mobile telephony ahead of everyone else and pioneered some things like M-Pesa, mobile payments. That was pioneered in East Africa. And so you see that. Uh, and also the ubiquitous of, ubiquitousness of text messages, which were incredibly expensive here in the yep. States, and they were mm -hmm. analog. And then yep. Africans, everybody's using them. I'm like, like this is crazy. It's like almost <laughs> free. Yep. So so I my argument here is that while Africa does need to industrialize, it mm. needs to not focus solely on industrial. It needs to go above that to the, next, to the next revolution and incorporate all of that into economic growth and development. Because the bottom line is this, unlike the ANC in South Africa, which seems to think that the future is making people be farmers, which it's not, the world has mm. moved away from that. Less than 1% of the labor force in America works in agriculture mm. and we're the world's mm. largest economy. <clears throat> the answer is training and education. Proper yeah. literacy, proper education, and getting people into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and other fields like that. That's the key. If you get proper education, the, the sky is the limit, and all Africans can succeed, and that's what I hope for. I hope that's coming. Yes, I, I, I completely agree with you. In fact, the speech I just gave, and, and it's publicly available, the, one of the ways I ended it was um, Africa does not need to build other people's past. Yeah. Meaning they don't have to rebuild where people are coming from or where people are moving away from. Yeah. But they can actually create the future of the world. They can envision what the where the world is going. And they can actually, this is where leapfrogging actually happens. Mm -hmm. One of the incredible things I see as human nature is just in the context of people like talking. We talk about for for, for so long, people have talked about Africa leapfrogging, Africa leapfrogging, right? Mm -hmm. But they are missing the moment where leapfrogging actually can happen, mm -hmm. right? So for 10 years, people say Africa should leapfrog, leapfrog. But now you now have the opportunity to actually leapfrog and you're like, mm, maybe not. <laughs> well, <laughs> well you're, there's also cultural resistance too. And that's in every society. So I mean, yeah, but, but, but the other piece too is that Honestly, and this is not a dig on Africa. I, as you know, I've lived all over Africa, with the exception of in the center of the continent. Lived in North Africa, I've lived in West Africa, South Af Southern Africa, and East Africa. But, but the reality is, is that education in Africa is not where it needs to be, and people mm. don't want to admit that. First I'm off, slapping my hands for first you. First off, That's my I, have, word. I have been railing against this for decades. The fact that anyone must pay a fee to send their child to school through primary and secondary school is a crime. That's unacceptable. Listen, this is coming from a small government, conser fiscally conservative person who believes that the role of government is only to ensure a level playing field, not to take care of everybody. That's where I come from. That's my worldview. Now, there are exceptions to that, but that's my general worldview. But public education, primary school through secondary school is a societal responsibility. You mm. can't have a functioning society with illiterate people who can't think, who don't have intellectual capacity. So we have an obligation to continue our society successfully to educate our progeny through primary and secondary school. Now, university is another story because university makes the elites. Uh, mm -hmm. whether, whether you think you're an elite or not, once you have a university degree, you are an elite because you, <laughs> when, when, when you, because you can enter a world to earn an income 10, 20, 100 times more than the average person. That's mm -hmm. why this whole nonsense with free student loan nonsense here in the States for all these people who have education whining <laughs> about how they've had a good life and other people are, are, are wow. digging up ditches and, and picking strawberries and they're supposed to pay for that now. No, so, but when it comes to primary school, it has to be fixed. No one should be paying school fees to put their kids through school. I've no. watched Africans take all their income just to send their kids to a private school because public schools are so poor and they had to pay school fees. So they send them to private school. That's the first thing. Second thing is education in much of Africa is not education. Mm. It's rote, it is rote memorization. And you were told you were told what to think and how to think. It's not education. It's not education. Oh my gosh. Wow. It's true. It's true. And you, you can't wow. have a, you can't build an entrepreneurial class of Africans who have now you get that anyway, just because it's a nature of some people, they pick it up on their own. But you can't you can't build a class of people or a society in which people sp come up with ideas and they take chances and they take risk and they and they and they have this, whether it's in arts or music or engineering or design, whatever it is. People don't have that capacity if they go to school and they're just told 
This is what it is. Read this. Memorize this. You say this 10 times. Okay, now you're educated. No, you're not educated. Now you're a trained uh, you're a trained circus act. That's what you are. Okay, oh let's use that goodness. phrase. No, it's, come on, Toy. Come on. I mean, listen, oh, you know gosh. the schools I'm talking about where kids don't get taught to think. You must learn as you grow up after primary school, after you become literate, you can read and write in whatever your language is. Then you must learn to think. And thinking is not something that comes naturally, thinking critically. It's a skill. In order to have that skill, it must be fostered at a young age. The sooner that critical thinking is fostered, say at 12, 13, 14 years of age, the better a society is and the more you get out of it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> this is good. Uh, this is good. And I see Abata said, this is the best beta truth I have ever had in my life. <laughs> That's incredible. You know, Maybe I will say it differently. Maybe in a more <laughs> nicer now, re re way. Re remember, Toy, remember, remember, this is an outside view of someone that loves Africa, has spent most of their life in Africa, but I'm not an African. It's an outside view looking in. And I've been yeah. I've been deeply involved in education there too. So that's important to know. Whereas your view, and I don't know what you're going to say, but I'm going to guess, but your view comes from having grown up in a system inside of Africa, in a system where you experienced some of what I'm talking about or you didn't experience it. So go ahead. Yes. Okay. And, and I have had time to actually also explore what are the gaps, right? And mm -hmm. one of the gaps is what you just really, really just put out there. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that, and I've studied regions around the world in terms of what did they do to fix this? Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Part of what you're explaining right now is the residual impact of colonization, right? Sure, absolutely, and, no and, doubt about it. And India in the late 70s, early 80s, actually scrapped entirely the education system, mm -hmm. the British system, and they basically started from scratch, making sciences, like you said earlier on, STEM, mm -hmm. right? Making it required. And 40 years after, see, India is playing big when it comes to, you know, intellectual capital, technology, mm -hmm. space, exploration, all of those things. But I don't think India would be where it is today if they hadn't made that bold move to completely do away with the old education system and rebuild it from scratch. And I think that bold move is what would be required in Africa as well. Because what you said in terms of my experience, you're right. I had my post-secondary, even my first degree on the continent. And then I came to the US for my graduate program, Masters of Science and in Information System. So I see both worlds, right? Mm -hmm. I see the, the, the both sides. The biggest thing that the British education system on the continent hasn't done is what you called out. But I will say it differently as not we have literate illiterate. That was because I also write, you know, I can put words. When I experience something, I'm like, how do I describe it to somebody? Meaning people can read and write. But the real education that it takes to create the future and to solve problems in your community and your society, mm -hmm. that's what's missing. What's also missing is this, uh, it's, it's in a simple way, I would call it project management. Mm -hmm. That's the oversimplified version. But what I mean is, see, it's almost like problem, <laughs> problem solution mindset of everybody on the continent knows what the issues are. Sure. Everybody. From a two-year-old to five-year-old, they sit back and they can talk about the problem, which is what British do very well. Hey, good morning. Nice coffee. Nice tea. They're reading the newspaper. That's what they handed over. They handed that. But what they did not teach Africa is yeah. how they conquer the rest of the world, how they use resources, how they build communities. They taught Africa how to... So, so a lot of Africans, now I can say in particular Nigerians, mm -hmm. intellectually the best in the world. We're the best lawyers, the best doctors. There are some fields where we're thriving. And there are definitely finance. some finance, everything that, so intellectually fantastic. I think where things start breaking down is resource management. It's pro problem solutions. It's project management. It's realizing that you have everything you need. Now, the other thing, because you brought this on in terms of my personal experience, is also the residual side of colonialism has to do with um, the colonial masters telling you, give us all your wealth, give us all your resources, mm -hmm. and then we will manage it for you. Mm -hmm. And then sit in your nice looking place. We will give you what you do. Just tell us what you need and we'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. That mindset still persists where a lot of Africans, they are waiting for the Messiah. They're mm. waiting for the savior. Mm -hmm. Like they are, they're waiting for somebody out there to come and take them out, not realizing that the solution is within you. Sure. The solution looks African. Mm -hmm. 
that's what people don't realize is that the solution is African, looks African, and is in Africa. Now you can go to the rest of the world, and this is what they need to know how to do really well, which is now I'm moving into the education side. In fact, this month I'm teaching my maybe the fifth or sixth class of my trade and investment facilitation masterclass, mm -hmm. which is leveraging resources and networks to get what you want, to implement projects, to, to put all those things together. Because at the end of the day, Africa has is the richest continent when it comes to natural resources. But guess what? They give it out raw and then they import back finished goods and all of that, be it oil, um, diamonds is big, where it's polished in India <laughs> before it, we can go on and on. But for me, it's coming down to what's the gap and how do you fill this gap temporarily? Because the permanent solution would take a huge, bold political move. And I don't see who is ready yet among the leaders. Well, I, I, I agree with you that lots of people seem to think they know the answer. But I also like your phrase. I think you said uh, literate illiterates. But, but when it comes to Africa and, and, and the West, I think there are also illiter illiterate literates. In other words, Ooh. people with people with university degrees that don't know their bum Ooh. from a hole in the ground. Oh uh, my gosh! I'm serious. That's that's uh, <laughs> it, there, and there are a lot of those people walking around. You know, oh. it's uh, and, let's wait, 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 wait. Let yeah. let let that sink in. Okay. Okay. okay you're, you're saying yes that um, people that are well educated. I didn't say all. Okay. Okay. Say it. Your say it slowly. Well, okay. Okay. Say, I, say I, it slowly. I, 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 I'm well educated too. I have multiple degrees, so I'm not going to throw myself <laughs> off the boat too. You know, no. What I'm saying is that there are a number of people in the developed world and in Africa, around the world, who are highly educated, but they are completely clueless Ooh. because their education comes with bigotry, bias, and a worldview that they can't disassociate themselves with. And a lot of this has to do with 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 culture, whether it's in the West or in Africa, uh, on both sides of the political spectrum. And people just can't let go. I got attacked yesterday on LinkedIn by some guy because I made a comment. And I said, uh, politics, I said, uh, and this is an example. This guy's a lecturer at a university. And I, I just made a comment not to him. Someone else posted. And um, the guy was um, talking about going after Trump. And I'm like, I said, you know, it's fascinating how people just keep talking about Trump and keeping him in the news. And it's just in the minds of these people on the left, they can't let go. It's almost demonic. I said, it's it's kind of entertaining. And then I, I did a little quote from Monty Python, you know, she's a witch. Look at her nose. Oh, they put this nose on me. No, we didn't. Did you? Mm. Well, yeah, we did put the nose on her. So burn her, she's a witch. And the point is that is that just let go of it. Let it go. But and, and I, that was my point. So I get attacked by this guy and he accused me, he says, people of my ilk, so I'm like, people of my ilk, what are you talking about? What ilk? Well, basically he's getting at you, you people who support this guy who did insurrection. Mm -hmm. All I'm like, where did you, where did you divine from my sentences that I even like or, or voted for or support Trump? I never said that you're, mm -hmm. you're inferring something that was never implied or stated. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this person goes on and on with personal attacks and ad hominem coming after me, even after making very clear that he's wrong. I don't like Donald Trump. I voted for him, but I don't like the guy. I voted for a lot of people don't like it's not, not a question of liking them. Trump's a bore. He's a he's a cat. But anyway, that's a whole story. But but anyway, but but the point is here is that is okay. So when it, let's get back to the education. So I I see your point in India, but there was a lot more play in India than just reforming the education system, and it does take a long time. That's why I said in '94 that the African National Congress has a golden opportunity, but South Africans must be patient because it will take two generations to, mm. to fix this. It will take. Two generations of kids <clears throat> going through Listen. school before they ever, I'm just coughing here, <clears throat> before they ever get to the stage where they will be able to make sufficient progress because it takes wow. that long to educate. Well, it takes that long to educate people. You have to educate kids from primary school through secondary school in a proper fashion, not give them substandard education and prevent them from accessing the economy. But that takes 20 years just to get the first batch through. So you have to be patient and it takes time building up, but they weren't. But in South Africa, we have people running around, science must fall. Okay, because it's because it's colonialist. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Okay, so science is you have an idea, you propose a hypothesis, you test whether it's valid or not, and then you come up with a conclusion. And science is never settled; it can always be refuted. You may have dis discovered something new and find out that your premise was wrong. And now here's the new science. For instance, Pluto, we were told, was a dead planet. There's nothing on Pluto. It's an ice ball. It's so far away from the sun. But when New Horizons flew past it a few years ago, guess what? It's a geologically active world within the last 10 million years, which in, you know, in, in time, you know, is like, that's nothing. So the point is the science is never settled. So I don't know that 
education in Africa has to be thrown out wholesale, although I, I, we could try it in a few places, see how it works. I do think that it needs massive reform. That's my mm. point. It needs mm. massive reform. You don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You can if you want, um, but but that's that's a challenge too. But I think it needs mass reform. It needs to go from checking blocks, checking blocks to learning. It's not about learning. Very few mm. pe people learn in spite of the education mm. system, not because of it. That's my point with that. So. Yes, and, and I completely understand what you're saying. And I see it play out. I'll say the same thing, maybe in a different way again, is what I see happening particularly in the world of trade and investment, is that everybody, a lot of people assume they understand what it takes to implement it. Sure. That's what I see happening, especially even the more, it seems the more elite that person is, the, the, the more they think that they, they can actually figure it out. And yes, yes. So, so, so I understand that. And when those people approach trade, that's why even the failure rate is higher. Because when you don't approach things as a student of life, mm -hmm. because that's what I have done. Before I ventured and left Walmart, my, my, my previous career, I know what I invested. Like we all invest in building a career. Yeah. I, used to, I used to take classes in my previous career that was $5,500, $5,500 just to get better in my previous career. So I know what I invested in my graduate program to be at the top of my previous career when i moved into trade and investment the first two three years was all about talking and engaging and sitting at the feet of presidential advisors economic advisors global leaders just listening to them mm -hmm. not coming into that conversation like i know what i'm doing i'm like no tell me more and that's where i got all of the um the mentoring and sponsoring and coaching um, that before this was even before I ended up leaving and resigning to do mm -hmm. build Nazaru. For example, I'll just give, and this is what I see. I don't know what the solution is, is that people need to approach trade and investment first as a student of it. Because when you look at the numbers, the reason the numbers are so low is because people don't know how to execute trade transactions. They just need to admit that for once. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for example, let me just play this out. Um, while I was doing my research, I was like, oh, economic development, trade. I think trade is there. This was years ago. Okay. And one of, I was talking to a vice president and he was like, Toin, I'm from Chile. Have you ever read the story about Chile? I'm like, no. He said, oh, have Chile you ever. Chile is an amazing story. Uh, well, yeah. fun, and, their and, economy. And, yeah. He asked me a tough, several questions. He was like, what is the GDP of this? What is, I was like, oh, I don't know. He said, Toin, don't you ever have a conversation about economic development without knowing the GDP of the country you're talking about. I was like, okay. So I was schooled years ago. Mm -hmm. Another schooling he gave me was, okay, have you ever heard about Chicago boys? I'm like, no, go and read about it. But let me give you the summary. He said, I think late seventies, early eighties, she said, what you're explaining about the continent of Africa, she, Chile was there. I was mm -hmm. like, yeah. And he said, at that time they were under a dictator, but they had this arrangement with the U S government and they sent what they call chicago boys to the university of chicago to mm -hmm. study under the most notable economics at that time but yep. the agreement was come back home and when those boys came back home they were positioned in the cabinet of the dictator and mm -hmm. he said a movie if in fact the movie exists the chicago boys there's a movie out you know mm -hmm. there's you can read everybody can research that movie but i'm just giving this as an example right and he said all the things they, they learned in the U.S., they implemented it back home. It took years, but they are now one of the most productive countries in the world. Yeah, Chile Chile is, is an amazing story. That was under Augustino Pinochet, who was the dictator mm. who overthrew the Salvador Allende's government in 1973. Eventually was arrested as a former head of state and illegally detained and illegally mm. prosecuted. Mm. You can't prosecute a head of state for that. But anyway, but they they, they did that. So uh, Pinochet's government, in fact, was guilty of a lot of abuses, human rights abuses, mm. not to yeah. say the least. But they did put in place an economic structure which mm -hmm. is benefited Chileans immensely. You know, I always find it fascinating when people – you know, so for instance, when I raise the issue about land reform and, and land tenure, because that's a big issue in Africa, Ghana, land tenure is an issue because people can't own title to land in many cases. In South Africa, this whole um, uh, canard about land theft and expropriation that's going on mm, now. About mm. land. Listen, um, you know, the thing about land is that um, 
people want to talk about land and they never look at agrarian reform or, or, or land reform in South Korea. They never look at it in other locations where it's, and of course in Peru, where it had a major impact, uh, creating land tenure and giving people ownership of land that they already occupy or that they're using creates vast store of wealth. For instance, South Africa could unlock billions of dollars of capital tonight. Mm. Yeah, this is how you do it. The millions of people living in RDP, that's the uh, the state-provided uh, homes, uh, basically if you want to call them welfare homes, I guess, but state-provided homes, which the state retains title to and has a little plot of land around it. They're nothing fancy, but they're physical structures. Grant the people who are living in those homes title to the house and land, right like that. If you care about the poor, do it tonight. And guess what? Today, I have two children and a little shack on the veld, and I have no money and no resources. Tomorrow, Just give them I have the a, land. I, I have the piece. Of, I have the piece of land and the house, and it's worth a hundred thousand rand. So I can go to a bank because I have collateral now, and I can say, "Listen, I want to expand my fruit business that I sell on the side of the street, and I need to buy new carts. Can you give me five hundred dollar loan for that?" Well, you have collateral now that they can repossess. That's just one short answer. But the point is that is that uh, people talk about economics and they either take the wrong examples like Bernie Sanders. Oh, look, at look, at look, Scandinavia. Yeah, democratic socialism. Yeah, yeah, that's the answer. No, no, you don't understand what happened in, in Scandinavia or you're dishonest, Bernie Sanders. Scandinavia is less socialist than the United States. The government spends less money in their economy than our government does. And that's because their economy nearly collapsed in 1992. I was there. I remember this. And if I had been there, I would have studied. The point is that people don't look at the whole picture. They always want to apply this solution. Oh, the China model is what African needs. There's no China model. China is a communist government running a pseudo-capitalist marketplace with state control overlapped on top of it and protectionist economy that keeps everything out. And it mm -hmm. works for them. It works for them. But it won't work forever. And they're already having lots of problems even before COVID. So, But yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really frustrating about um, how people – really don't grasp things. They don't know about things. You know, you, you were talking about, the gentleman said, don't go to conversation, not GDP, GDP of a country. Uh, I tell that to, <laughs> to no, seriously. No, but I, I tell the people, I say, you know, when they ask me about, you know, how are you successful in NBC? I said, listen, I never went to a meeting with development officers from the Agency for International Development, USAID, and State Department political officers in which I didn't know as much or more about the issue that was going to come up in that meeting than they did. Now, maybe mm -hmm. not the particular event that they have going on, but when they start talking about Yovari Museveni and political opposition, I know all about it because I educated myself because I felt that I didn't want to come to a meeting in which I couldn't engage intellectually exactly. for the betterment, the betterment of the mission. So I learned all about those things. When I trained my intel analyst, I used to make a list of things when I worked at Defense Intelligence Agency and other places. Whenever you write about a country, you should know these things. You should know the GDP. You should know the size because we're talking about security. Know the size of the military, what the structure of the military is, what their budget is, if it's declining, if it's going up and down, what they've been involved in. Have they done a peacekeeping? Have they not been peacekeeping? Do they do domestic work? Do they contribute to civil society? If you don't know these things, then you can't speak authoritatively about <laughs> the subject. Exactly. Exactly. And Toyin, let me tell you something. 95% of analysts that I ever came across don't know any of that stuff. Yet they're writing wow. reports saying, this is what's happening in country X. How can you say that when you don't know what you're talking about? These are basic things. So when people uh, talk about Niger, Niger needs all this help, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Do you know that Niger has the lowest human development index of every country in the world? It's 181. Yes, I know there's 194, but little islands don't count in the scheme mm. of things. Anyway, <laughs> but 181 of all countries, it's the lowest human development index. And that explains a lot about Niger. People, whoa, it's all because they, they invaded Libya and all the weapons came. No, the Tuareg and rebel groups were a problem in Niger for decades. They had one coup after another. They've had these problems for ages. And it's a lot more than simply blaming it on NATO bombing Libya and taking out Muammar Gaddafi. Mm. That's the childish super, that, that's why wow. we have that's why we have Boko Haram. No, it's not. We have Boko Haram because the Nigerian government refused to listen to the legitimate demands of people wow. in the northern part of the country who were upset that not enough resources were being sent their way from wow. Abuja. And that's why you have wow. it. It metastasized. Anyway, wow. but the point is that people always go for the simple answer. And here's the thing. Now, let me get this in because before you, I think this is important for people to understand. What always happens with these things, whether it's politics, economics, culture, is all, people always instinctively apply a moral value to something. Mm. When I tell people in 1999 and in 2000, which I did, and I tell them today that reasons why HIV became so prevalent in Southern Africa is because of cultural norms and practices. <gasps> oh, you're a racist. You're attacking black. No, 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 no. First mm. off, first off, listen to the whole argument. 
What we discovered mm. through research and over time is that the number of, not, not to turn this into a conversation about HIV, but the number of sexual partners for the average male in Southern Africa is no different than the average male in Western Europe or the United States. Mm. <gasps> what? What? But, but you said, no, I never said that. You inferred that. I never put a moral value to it. I said that these are contributing factors like long distance trucking routes in which truckers sit for five days at the Kazungulu border crossing because you get across the river by ferry between Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. Now they have a bridge almost finished. You sit there for five days. And what do you do for five days sitting in your truck? Well, prostitutes who need money come along and you knock boots. And you get infected, you take it home, and you spread it to your family. Mm -hmm. And so people didn't want to hear that because they attach more jobs. I don't care that those truck drivers are doing that personally. And I'm not judging them. I could certainly empathize if somebody sit around for five days, nothing to do except eat, get fat, mm -hmm. drink booze, and do nothing. I understand how that happens. But I attach no moral value to it. But mm -hmm. it doesn't change the fact that it's true and it happened. Mm -hmm. But too many people get defensive and attach moral value to everything. It's like wow. Africa. When, when, when I talk about the education system being wrote, being wrote education in much of Africa, I'm not saying it's because Africans are bad, they're dumb, they're lazy, they're stupid. I'm just saying that's the way it is. And you won't fix things so, oh, until wow. you change it. You have to so, divorce yeah. yourself from moral, moral equivalence or more moral value. I think what you're saying here is really cause and effect. And, and cause yeah. and effect. In, in, and and it's, it's a form of education that I think we're not doing an, enough of. And so people don't have the capacity to embrace conversations that are devoid of sentiments. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Emo like, devo devoid, devoid of emotion. Yeah, like, and I, yeah. I see that too playing out even in the world of trade and investment. And I'll describe it in a di slightly different way is mm -hmm. when people say, we want an investor, I need an investor. They come at it from a sentimental standpoint because mm -hmm. there's a mindset of begging. Mm -hmm. Like, I need this, I need that. And 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 because the narrative and the engagement on the continent has been dominantly aid driven where free money i say free because it's not free but people perceive it as donations so they are used to saying we need we need we need and they now mistake that world as an investor world so crossing them <laughs> over i have to really retrain to say when you say i need an investment i need investor just Think of it as like you're begging for money. Mm. What you need to try and do, remove that sentiment because an investor doesn't make those decisions out of sentiments. No, they, they are make looking them at a profit and loss. Yes. Yeah, so how about you try this? So this is part of this education that I'm providing is why don't you try saying, I have an investment opportunity I want to share with you. Now, mm. all of a sudden the investors say, hmm. I'm always looking for investment opportunities, so I'm willing to listen to you, but I'm not looking to give my money away. Exactly. So that's what I'm seeing is that I'm also having to educate people to drop the sentiment at the door and go more data. So my first degree is mathematics. Hmm. Okay. So I have a BS oh. in mathematics. So when, STEM, and, STEM. Oh. Well, yeah, and, and <laughs> part of the reason that I'm playing big with Nazaru is because the data is clear. The yeah. trend is clear. For someone like myself with the first degree in mathematics, when you have a trend that says population growth, you look at it in 1980, you look at it now, and you can easily project. Like, I, 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 I get it. In fact, another example is that when I was in corporate and I was in the strategy team, we had data, for example, that said by 2020, this was five, six years ago, by 2020, the purchasing power of Generation Z, 40% of purchasing power in the U.S. will be in the hands of Generation Z. Yeah. Okay. So five years ago, we already knew the trend that baby boomers were aging. The generation Z, what they call digital natives, right. that they they grew up with. They've always known Google, Facebook, Yahoo, mm -hmm. all of those people. Their world view is is shaped by those companies. That's scary. How <laughs> yeah, how they buy and how they live their life. They're digital natives, meaning they live. They dine, eat, yeah. exist in the digital world. And so for us, and that's where my training comes in, you can look at that data and decide to do the ostrich mindset and put your head in the sand, you know, and put your head in the sand and say, oh, nothing is happening. Or you can confront the data and start building, assuming it's going to happen. Which what you're saying, it's, it's, it's like, I also think it's a type of education that is missing where people are making 
decisions or listening to information through the lens of sentiment. You see it play out in the political space, right? Even in past, when you mix religion, politics, it's, it's no longer fact, it's no longer data, it's no longer insight. And then people cannot really engage in, in, in real um, fact-based dialogue again. So I see it in different ways. And these are things we have to shift as well. I'm looking at time as well. Yeah. So I'm trying to see the best way to wrap it up because you and I can go on and on. I also see a few questions. So um, what I would just want to ask you last before I just pull some questions in would be, I see a huge shift when it comes to US engagement and expansion mm -hmm. in Africa, where South Africa seems to have lost its ranking as the number one in my mind um, destination for US engagement investment. I'm seeing Kenya through the conversations Kenya was having. That was where my eyes until a couple of weeks ago, I just saw Morocco pop up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Morocco, I was like, okay, what's going on? When you look at the landscape, so the South Africa has lost its stand. Kenya seemed to have been playing, you know, with Trump um, presidency. But the last couple of weeks, I've seen some major, major investment put into Morocco. Mm -hmm. Well, South Africa is unappealing because um, a government uh, doesn't want to live by the rule of law. Frankly, in my view, the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act uh, benefits should be suspended for South Africa. The mere mention of expropriating property without compensation violates the the tenets of the Africa Growth Opportunity Act. That, mm -hmm. The fact that that's been tabled in the parliament should have led to an immediate suspension of AGOA, which wow. would affect $20 billion in trade between South Africa and the U.S. every year. That's my view. If I were president, they wouldn't be in AGOA. And tough wow. nuggies. I mean, listen, I don't want to hear about historical injustice. That's nonsense. <laughs> no, no, you, no. Have, you have an expropriation bill. You have expropriation built into the Constitution written by a majority government. They can't expropriate property, but what they want to do is steal property. They don't want to expropriate it. They want to steal it. And they're not expropriating mm. the property they've taken. Much of it lays fallow. None of the assistance is provided to people who want to move on to it as farms. No extension services, no credit, no training, no seeds, no equipment. So that's a real problem. But um, yeah, it's... Um, it's uh it's anyway it's uh it's <laughs> sorry it's just no it's, no it's, I, there's I, a I, lot I, there's a lot to unpack there and, and i just i know i know a long you, time. i mean just like you i have an open invitation you have an open invitation for me i think that's the same thing we are going to i'm going to say in terms of you have an open invitation because mm -hmm. this conversation needs to continue happening so we have wow thank you so much everyone joining us so let me bring on a few comments or questions sure. um Erica said the investment needs to start with restructuring education in the schools, teaching the kids a new economics trade system tailor made for Africa. I think we both agree on that, correct? Yeah, yep, yep. Okay, you have some fans here. <laughs> Mohammed said this point. guy has a good point. Well, thank you, Mohammed, okay. but I have lots of good points. <laughs> I think he was I think he was talking about not a tour attaching moral moral value to things. That's I mean, that's the bottom line. People need to let go of that. Because you're never going to get anywhere if you constantly, you know, if you constantly put yourself behind these walls. Well, this is because of this. This is because of that. No, we're all at fault. We've all made mistakes. We all can fix this. Let's move on. Yes, Erica says my mind is blown. Wow, oh wow. Okay, <laughs> and you also have what, a big fan, Morenike. Hello, Morenike. She's a journalist out of Nigeria. Very interesting guest. So that's amazing. Okay, Fabian said to. Share this on your feed. Would love to watch it later. I'm sure people are, I know people, people actually, um, when I look at the statistics, I'm, yeah. I'm big on numbers. There are actually more people that watch after, yeah, yeah. after we go live. So, so yes, we, this is actually live streaming to um, my LinkedIn. We have a YouTube channel, Nazaru Trade with Africa channel. We have a ton of information there. So yes, and then on Facebook as well. So this is going to be available. And finally, it's also on Nazaru.tv. Okay, wow, we have so many comments. What I'll also um, suggest, or if I may ask you, sir, is a lot of questions we may not be able to get to, but you can find those questions on my profile where we've live streamed, so mm -hmm. you can al al always engage directly with people as well. So we'll get to all the questions even after our live. I'm trying to wrap up because of time um, now. Um, <laughs> Joseph says Superman ain't coming. Good point, Tony. No, he's yes. not, and, and and you shouldn't expect him, and and you shouldn't you shouldn't like <laughs> Mo Ibrahim and Cyril Ramaphosa try to guilt Superman into doing your job by not 
by not engaging <laughs> pharmaceutical companies for the past 14 months, not participating in the studies, not offering your citizens to participate in voluntary trials, not contributing, not negotiating deals, sitting back and going, we're part of COVAX. COVAX will take care of everything. And when it failed, whoa, they're mm. biased against the global south. No, you didn't mm. get involved. So you failed, Cyril Ramaphosa. Mo Ibrahim, why you're even in this conversation, I don't know. Go back to awarding prizes and building telecom companies. <laughs> oh, my gosh, crazy. <laughs> okay, so there's also this um, Sophie says excellent and the key of making Africa succeed and becoming independent enough to survive and trade. I believe that's the last yeah. comment there on trade. Yeah. Okay, um, well... This is interesting. Abata is one of the members of my network. You are also a member. You're on our yep. network, right? Yep. Um, she's actually joining from Northern Nigeria. So everything you talked about, Boko Haram, Northern Nigeria, it's it's. she tells me a lot about the Northern youth and all that. But this is what she said just now. This is the best bitter truth I have ever heard in my life. And this had to do with when you talked about education in terms yep. of the need to educate. Um, and then, David, I think this would be the last one we could talk we could pick on before we wrap up. Um, but do you view trade in Africa moving in the right direction, given the recent de decision by Ghana's president to re renegotiate their cocoa trade with Europe? Hmm. I do you want to take yeah, I think it's a good question. Ghana also just negotiated a bilateral trade agreement with the United Kingdom since they're not part of the European Union anymore. Um, when you had all these people opposed to Brexit because they're the deep status, uh, use American term here, deep status who love the European Union uh, despite all of its shortcomings, uh, and they said that it would be a disaster for the UK. In fact, it's an opportunity for, for the UK to have a rebirth and revival. And I think evidence of it are the trade agreements that's working out with other countries, which are working to its benefit and the trade partner's benefit. And I think in Ghana's case, we'll see what happens, but this bilateral trade agreement may work very well to Ghana's advantage. Uh, I think that, um, that trade is moving in the right direction, but the intra-African trade needs to be a focus. And the African Continental Free Trade Agreement talks about it, but very little is being done to promote it. It's kind of like... AIMS 2050, the African Integrated Maritime Strategy 2050, which is a brilliant document drafted at the African Union talking about maritime security strategy development. It's wonderful, but there's no champion behind it. There's no one mm. forcing it to happen. And it addresses terrorism, it, piracy, natural resources, fisheries, you know, uh, all these different things, um, search and rescue, everything you could think of is addressed. It was a brilliant plan written by military people at the African Union. Um, and I know the people involved in it, an African from Cameroon and a, a Danish officer who was there to help them, but it doesn't have a champion. So I think trade is moving in the right direction for Africa, but intra-African trade must increase. And there's lots of potential for it, but there's still lots of barriers. And that's part of it. But here's the thing, and this is the reason why I've gotten this space, uh, in this space, this trade space with Africa and been involved with it. And, and Toy invited me to come a couple years ago. Africa is the El Dorado. Africa mm. is the next great horizon. Yeah, I know people have been saying that for 30, 40, 50 years. Well, they may have been premature for a number of reasons, for a lot of uh, outlying factors that, that were beyond Africans' influence and some within their influence. But the reality is this. Whether you like it or not, Africa will have 2.3 to 2.5 billion people in the year 2050. By the way, folks, that's not very far away. That's less than three decades away. So in less than three decades, there will be 2.3 to 2.5 billion people. Whether you like Africa, you love Africa, you hate Africa, you detest Africa, you don't want to hear about Africa, Africa will be there and in your face, mm. whether you want to or not. And it won't be Africans migrating to North America or Latin America or Europe or Asia because they're all over China too. Yes, they'll be there, but it will be that many people on the continent of Africa alone, not to mention the diaspora that has links back there. So if you want to be a first-rate world economic power in the year 2050, United States, you must get involved in Africa. And now not selling Boeing aircraft and Microsoft software and Caterpillar tractors, but I'm talking about Verizon and Xfinity and McDonald's, somewhere beyond Morocco, Egypt, and South Africa, and mm. Burger King and Papa John's, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And if we don't engage, we're going to be a second-rate economic power. Eric, mm. if you're still here, please tell people I'll be on my stream shortly. <laughs> yes. Wow. 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 So I was going to ask you for your parting words and what you just gave now. It's like, <laughs> I have to just rewind and re-listen because boy, that was so captivating. Thank you so much. Anything else you want to share before we just wrap up? Well, yeah, let me pimp my channel. I've got to pimp please, my channel. Please, here, so. <laughs> please, help yourself. Yeah. Help yourself. For for those who don't know my channel, which um, I, I went in, in, in YouTube jail recently, so you might find that interesting, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm on multiple platforms, but my primary platform for the moment, till I get censored, is um, 
He's on YouTube. <laughs> and so all you do is go to YouTube, look up Chris Wyatt Africa. You'll find my page. Please feel free to subscribe. And you'll find playlists on different topics, the African Union. I have a big focus on Southern Africa, but I cover the entire continent. I do stories on Liberia, on Uganda, on Niger, on Mauritania. But uh, the majority of my coverage uh, when it comes to prepare videos tends to be in Southern Africa, but it's not exclusive. You'll find a lot of coverage of Bobby Wine. Great musician, African, who's not profiting from his money and being thrown in prison by, you know, by the president. And then, you know, uh, things like Veeam Peasy in uh, Botswana, another great musician who doesn't get to make much money from his skills. But anyway, Chris White Africa on YouTube and multiple platforms, Odyssey, Rumble, BitChute, all that other nonsense. But <laughs> but uh, catch me on YouTube and I look forward to uh, seeing you next time, Toyn. Wow. Thank you so much. Such an honor to just learn from you and grow with you as well. And um you have an open invitation, obviously, um, to be back here. And thank you so much for being Likewise, here. Likewise, Rec reciprocity. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And thank you for being on our network as well. I, I hope, you know, you're taking advantage of it. There's a lot of stuff going on there. The DMing part. I know people are DMing and re re um, reaching out. So when I do post this in our private group network, because I also do private coaching there, I will make sure to tag you. That way people can start messaging you as well. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So... This has been incredible. Do check us out, nazaro.tv. We also have a YouTube channel and also um, nazaro.com to see the great work that we're doing when it comes to coaching, consulting, education, and our trade with Africa platforms and events as well. It's been a huge pleasure to have um, Colonel Chris Wyatt retired here with me. And, um, you know, thank you again and see you all next time. Bye.